You're listening to WKCR-FM New York and WKCR-HD. That's 89.9 on the dial if you're on the New York airwaves or WKCR.org if you're anywhere else. Welcome to another installment of WKCR's Soundstage, our weekly Tuesday evening radio drama or radio play show. Tonight we have for you uh, the beginning chunk of The Glass Menagerie. Uh, returning tonight are some of our usual suspects. Um, John Howley will be reading for Tom. Uh, Madeline George, who you heard last week as Catherine in Proof, will be reading for Amanda and actually uh, putting on her home accent for the part. And the brilliant Maya Weed will be reading for Laura. Uh, and I will be reading Stage Directions. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And before we get started, I just uh, would like to ask everyone to say their character before we start. I'll be reading Stage Directions. Tom. Amanda. Laura. The Wingfield apartment is in the rear of the building. The apartment faces an alley and is entered by a fire escape. Tom enters dressed as a merchant sailor from alley and strolls across the front of the stage to the fire escape. There he stops and lights a cigarette. He addresses the audience. Yes, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things at my sleeve, but I am the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you the illusion that has the appearance of truth. I give you the truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. (laughs) To begin with, I turn back time. I reverse it to that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of America was matriculating in a school for the blind. Their eyes had failed them, or they had failed their eyes. And so they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down on the fiery braille alphabet of a dissolving economy. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion. In Spain, there was Guernica. Here, there were disturbances of labor, sometimes pretty violent, in otherwise peaceful cities like Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis. This is the social background of the play. The play is memory. Being a memory play, it is dimly lighted, It is sentimental. It is not realistic. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. That explains the fiddle and the wings. I am the narrator of the play and also a character in it. The other characters are my mother, Amanda, my sister, Laura, and a gentleman caller who appears in the final scenes. He is the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. But since I have a poet's weakness for symbols, I'm using this character also as a symbol. He is the long-delayed but always expected something that we live for. There is a fifth character in the play who doesn't appear except in this larger-than-life-size photograph over the mantle. This is our father, who left us a long time ago. He was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances. He gave up his job with the telephone company and skipped the light fantastic out of town. The last we heard of him was a picture postcard from Mazeltan on the Pacific coast of Mexico containing a message of two words. Hello. Goodbye. And no address. (laughs) I think the rest of the play will explain itself. He divides the portiers and enters the upstage area. Amanda and Laura are seated at a drop-leaf table. Tom? Yes, Mother? We can't say grace until you've come to the table. (sighs) Coming, Mother. Honey, don't push with your fingers. If you have to push with something, then push with the end of a crust of bread. And chew! Chew, animals have sections in their stomach which enable them to digest food without mastication, but human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down. Eat food leisurely, son, and really enjoy it. A well-cooked meal has lots of delicate flavors that have to be held in the mouth for appreciation. So chew your food and give your salivary glands a chance to function. I haven't enjoyed one bite of this dinner because of your constant directions on how to eat it. It's you that makes me rush through meals with your hawk-like attention to every bite I take. Sickening. Spoils my appetite. All this discussion of animal secretion, salivary glands, mustacication. Temperament like a metropolitan star. 
You're not excused from the table. I'm getting a cigarette. You smoke too much. I'll bring in the blanc manger. Oh, no, sister, no, sister. You be the lady this time, and I'll be the darky. I'm already up. Resume your seat, little sister. I want you to stay fresh and pretty for gentlemen callers. I'm not expecting any gentlemen callers. Sometimes they come when they are least expected. <laughs> Why, I remember one Sunday afternoon in Blue oh, Mountain. I know what's coming. Yes, but let her tell it. Again? She loves to tell it. One Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain, your mother received 17 gentlemen callers. Why, sometimes there weren't chairs enough to accommodate them all. How did you entertain those gentlemen callers? I understood the art of conversation. Oh, I bet you could talk. The girls in those days knew how to talk, I can tell you. Yeah? They knew how to entertain their gentlemen callers. It wasn't enough for a girl to be possessed of a pretty face and a graceful figure, although I wasn't alighted in either respect. She also needed to have a, a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions. What did you talk about? Things of importance going on in the world. Never anything coarse or common or vulgar. My callers were gentlemen. All. Among my callers, some of the most prominent young planters of the Mississippi Delta. Planters and sons of planters. Oh, there was young Champ Laughlin, who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Uh, Hadley Stevenson, who was drowned in Moon Lake and left his widow 150000 in government bonds. Then there were the Couture brothers, Wesley and Bates. Bates was one of my... My bright particular beau. He got in a quarrel with that wild Wainwright boy. They shot it out on the floor of Moon Lake Casino. Bates was shot right through the stomach. Died in the ambulance on his way to Memphis. His widow was also well provided for. Came into eight or ten thousand acres, that's all. She married him on the rebound. Never loved her. Carried my picture on him the night he died. And there was that boy that every girl in the Delta had set her cap for. That brilliant young Fitzhugh boy from Greene County. Where did he leave his widow? He never married. Oh, gracious, you talk as though all my old admirers had turned up their toes to the daisies. Isn't this the first you've mentioned that still survives? Uh, that Fitzhugh boy went north and made a fortune. Came known to be uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. He had the Midas touch. Whatever he touched turned to gold. And I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh, mind you, but I picked your father. Mother, let me clear the table. Oh, no, dear. You go in and study your typewriter chart. Or practice your shorthand a little. Stay fresh and pretty. It's almost time for our gentlemen callers to start arriving. How many do you suppose we're going to entertain this afternoon? I don't believe we're going to receive any, Mother. What? Not one? Not one? You must be joking. <laughs> not one, gentlemen caller. It can't be true. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. It isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, Mother. I'm, I'm just not popular like you were in Blue Mountain. Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid. Mm -hmm. Laura is seated in the delicate ivory chair at the small clawfoot table. She is washing and polishing her collection of glass. Amanda appears on the fire escape steps. Something has happened to her. It is written on her face. She slowly lets herself into the door. Slowly, Laura touches her lips with a nervous gesture. Hello, Mother, I, I was... Deception? Deception. How was the DAR meeting? Didn't you go to the DAR meeting, Mother? Oh, no, no. I did not have the strength to go to the DAR. In fact, I did not have the courage. I wanted to find a hole in the ground and hide myself in it forever. <laughs> She crosses to the wall and removes the diagram of the typewriter keyboard. She holds it in front of her for a second, stares at it sweetly and sorrowfully, then tears it into two pieces. Why did you do that, Mother? Amanda what? repeats the same procedure with the chart of the Greg alphabet. Why are you... Why? Why? How old are you, Laura? Mother, you know my age. I thought that you were an adult. It seems that I was mistaken. Please don't stare at me, Mother. What are we going to do? What is going to become of us? What is the future? Has something happened, Mother? Mother, has something happened? I'll be all right in a minute. I'm just bewildered. By life. Mother, I wish that you would tell me what's happened. As you know, I was supposed to be inducted into my office at the DAR this afternoon. But I stopped off at Rubicam's Business College to speak to your teachers about you having a cold and ask them what progress they thought you were making down there. Oh. 
I went to the typing instructor and introduced myself as your mother. She didn't know who you were. Wingfield, she said. We don't have any student enrolled at the school. I assured her that she did, that you had been going to classes since early January. I wonder, she said, if you could be talking about that terribly shy little girl who dropped out of school after only a few days attendance. Oh no, I said, Laura, my daughter has been going to school every day for the past six weeks. Excuse me, she said. She took the attendance book out, and there was your name, unmistakably printed. In all the days you were absent until they decided that you had dropped out of school, I said, no, there must have been some mistake. I, there must have been some mix-up in the records. And she said, no, I remember her perfectly now. Her hands shook so she couldn't hit the right keys. The first time we gave a speed test, she broke down completely, was sick at the stomach, and almost had to be carried into the washroom. After that morning, she never showed up anymore. We phoned the house but never got any answer. Well, while I was working at Famous and Bar, I suppose, demonstrating those, ugh, I was so weak I could barely keep on my feet. I had to sit down while they got me a glass of water. Fifty dollars tuition. All our plans, my hopes and ambitions for you, just gone up the spout, just gone up the spout like that. Laura, what are you doing? Laura crosses to the victriola and winds it up. Oh, I... Laura, where have you been going when you've gone on pretending that you were going to business college? I've just been going out walking. That's not true. It is. I just went walking. Walking. Walking in winter, deliberately courting pneumonia in that light coat. Where did you walk to, Laura? All sorts of places, mostly in the park. Even after you'd started catching that cold. It was the lesser of two evils, Mother. I couldn't go back up. I threw up on the floor. From half past seven till after five every day, you mean to tell me that you walked around in the park because you wanted to make me think you were still going to Rubicam's business college? It wasn't as bad as it sounds. I went inside places to get warmed up. Inside where? I went in the art museum and the birdhouses at the zoo. I visited the penguins every day. Sometimes I did without lunch and went to the movies. Lately, I've been spending most of my afternoons in the jewel box, that big glass house where they raise the tropical flowers. You did all this to deceive me, just for deception. Why? Mother, when you're disappointed, you get that awful suffering look on your face, like the picture of Jesus' mother in the museum. Oh, hush. I couldn't face it. So what are we going to do the rest of our lives? Stay home and watch the parades go by? Amuse ourselves with the glass menagerie, darling? Eternally play those worn-out phonograph records your father left as a painful reminder of him? We won't have a business career. We've given all that up because it made us nervous. What is there left but dependency all our lives? I know so well what becomes of unmarried women who aren't prepared to occupy a position. I've seen such pitiful cases in the South, barely tolerated spinsters living upon the grudging patronage of a sister's husband or brother's wife, stuck away in some little mousetrap of a room, encouraged by one in-law to visit another little bird-like woman without any nest, eating the crust of humility all their life. Is that the future that we've mapped out for ourselves? I swear, it's the only alternative I can think of. And it isn't a very pleasant alternative, is it? Of course, some girls do marry. Haven't you ever liked some boy? Yes. I liked one once. I came across his picture a while ago. He gave you his picture? No, it's in the yearbook. Oh, the high school boy. Yes, his name was Jim. Laura lifts the heavy annual from the clawfoot table. Here he is in the Pirates of Penzance. The what? The operetta the senior class put on. He had a wonderful voice, and we sat across the aisle from each other Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the odd. Here he is with a silver cup for debating. You see his grin? He must have had a jolly disposition. He used to call me Blue Roses. Why did he call you such a name as that? When I had that attack of pleurosis, he asked me what was the matter when I came back. I said pleurosis, and he thought I said Blue Roses. So that's what he called me after that. And whenever he saw me, he ho he'd holler, Hello, Blue Roses. I didn't care for the girl that he went out with, Emily Meisenbach. Emily was the best-dressed girl at Solden. She never struck me, though, as being sincere. It says in the personal section, they're engaged. That's six years ago. They must be married by now. Girls that aren't cut out for business careers usually wind up married to some nice man. Sister, that's what you'll do. 
<laughs> but, Mother. Yes? Well, I'm... I'm... I'm crippled. Nonsense. Laura, I've told you we never, never use that word. Why, you're not crippled. You just have a little defect. Hardly noticeable, even. When people have some slight disadvantage like that, they cultivate other things to make up for it. Develop charm and vivacity and charm. That's all you have to do. One thing your father had plenty of was charm. Tom speaks from the fire escape landing. After the fiasco at Rubicam's business college, the idea of getting a gentleman caller for Laura began to play a more and more important part in Mother's calculations. It became an obsession, like some archetype of the universal unconscious. The image of the gentleman caller haunted our small apartment. An evening at home rarely passed without some allusion to this image, this specter, this hope. Even when he wasn't mentioned, his presence hung in Mother's preoccupied look and in my sister's frightened, apologetic manner, hung like a sentence passed upon the wingfelts. Mother was a woman of actions as well as words. She began to take logical steps in the planned direction. Late that winter and early in the spring, realizing that extra money would be needed to properly feather the nest and plume the bird, she conducted a vigorous campaign on the telephone, roping in subscribers to one of those magazines for matrons called the Homemaker's Companion, the type of journal that features the serialized sublimations of ladies, of letters who think in terms of delicate cup-like breasts, slim, tapering waists, rich, creamy thighs, eyes like wood smoke in autumn, fingers that soothe and caress like strains of music, bodies as powerful as Etruscan sculpture. Amanda enters with a phone and a long extension cord. She is spotted in the dim state. Ida Scott, this is Amanda Wingfield. Uh, we missed you at the DAR last Monday. I said to myself, she's probably suffering with that sinus condition. How is that sinus condition? Oh, horrors. Heaven have mercy, you are a Christian martyr. Yes, that's what you are, a Christian martyr. <laughs> well, I have just happened to notice here that your subscription to the Companion is about to expire. Yes, it expires with the next issue, honey, just when that wonderful new serial by Bessie May Hopper is getting off to such an exciting start. Oh, honey, it's something that you just can't miss. You remember how Gone with the Wind took everyone by storm. <laughs> you simply couldn't go out if you hadn't read it. All everybody talked about was Scarlett O'Hara. Well, this is a book that critics already compare to Gone with the Wind. It's the, the Gone of the Wind of the post-World War generation. <laughs> what? A burning? Oh, honey, don't let them burn. Go take a look in the oven and I'll hold the wire. Well, heavens, I think she hung up. Tom and Amanda are quarreling. What in Christ's name Don't am you I use that supposed to do? Expression not oh. in my presence. Have you gone out of your senses? I have. That's true. Driven out. What is the matter with you, you big, big idiot? Look, I've got no thing, no single thing. Lower in your voice. my life here that I can call my own. Everything. Stop is... that shouting! Yesterday you confiscated my books. You had the nerve. To... I took that horrible novel back to the library. Yes, that hideous book by that insane Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> I cannot control the output of diseased minds or people who cater to him, but I won't allow such filth brought into my house. Oh. No, 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 house. no, no. House, who pays the rent on it? Who makes a slave of Don't himself? Don't you dare uh, to... No, 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 I mustn't say things. I've just got to... Let me tell you. I don't want to hear anymore. He tears the portiers open. Amanda's hair is in metal curlers, and she wears a very old bathrobe much too large of her much too large for her slight figure, a relic of the faithless Mr. Wingfield. An upright typewriter, wild as a ray of manuscripts, the quarrel probably precipitated by his creative labor. You will hear more. No. You I won't hear more. I'm going out. You come right back in. Out, 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 because I'm... Come back in here, Tom Wingfield. I'm not through talking oh, to you. Oh, oh, oh. Tom! You're going to listen, and no more insolence from you. I'm at the end of my patience. What do you think I'm at? Aren't I supposed to have any patience to reach the end of Mother? I know, I know. It seems unimportant to you what I'm doing, what I want to do. Having a little difference between them, you don't think I that I... I think that you've been doing things that you're ashamed of. That's why you act like this. I don't believe that you go every night to the movies. Nobody goes to the movies night after night. Nobody in their right minds go to the movies often as you pretend to. 
People don't go to the movies at nearly midnight, and movies don't let out at 2 a.m. Come in stumbling, muttering to yourself like a maniac. You get three hours of sleep and then go off to work. Oh, I can picture the way you're doing down there. Moping, doping, because you're in no condition. <laughs> no, I'm in no condition. What right have you got to jeopardize your job? Jeopardize the security of all of us? How do you think we'd manage if you were- Listen! You think I'm crazy about the warehouse? You think I'm in love with the Continental Shoemakers? You think I want to spend 55 years down there in that, that Celotex interior with fluorescent tubes? Look, I'd rather somebody pick up a crowbar and batter out my brains than go back in the mornings. I go. I go every morning, every time you come in yelling that goddamn rise and shine, rise and shine. I say to myself, how lucky dead people are. But I get up. I go. For $65 a month, I give up all that I dreamed of doing and being ever. And you say, and you say, self? Self's all I ever think of? Why, listen, if self is what I thought of mother, I'd be where he is. Gone! As far as the system of transportation reaches. She grabbed his arm. Don't grab me, mother! Where are you going? I'm going to the movies. I don't believe that lie. I'm going to the opium dens. Yes, yes, opium dens. Dens of vice and criminal hangouts, mother. I joined the Hogan gang. I'm a hired assassin. I, I carry a Tommy gun and a violin case. I run a string of cat houses in the valley. Oh, oh, they call me Killer, Killer Wingfeld. I'm leading a double life, a simple, honest warehouse worker by day. By night, a dynamic czar of the underworld, mother. I go to gambling casinos. I spin away fortunes on the roulette table. I wear a patch over one eye and a false mustache. Sometimes, oh, sometimes, I put on green whiskers. On those occasions, they call me El Diablo. Oh, I could tell you things to make you sleepless. My enemies plan to dynamite this place. Oh, they're gonna blow us all sky high some night. I'll be glad, very happy, and so will you. You'll go up. Up on a broomstick, over, over Blue Mountain with 17 gentlemen callers, you ugly, babbling old witch! He seizes his coat, lunges to the door, pulls it fiercely open. His elbow strikes against the shelf of Laura's glass collection, and there is a tinkle of shattering glass. Uh, my, my glass! Menagerie! I won't speak to you until you apologize! She crosses through the portieres and draws them together behind her. Tom is left with Laura. Laura clings weakly to the mantle. Tom drops awkwardly on his knees to collect the fallen glass. Well, one crack and it falls through. <sighs> Tom, Tom, what are you doing? I'm looking for a door key. Where have you been all this time? I've been to the movies. All this time at the movies? Yeah, there was a very long program. Th th there was a Garbo picture and a Mickey Mouse and a travel log and a newsreel and a, a preview of coming attractions. Oh, and, and there was an organ solo and a collection for the Milk Fund simultaneously, which uh, <laughs> ended up in a terrible fight between a fat lady and an usher. <laughs> Did you have to stay through everything? Of course. Oh, and I forgot. There was a big stage show. Mm -hmm. The headliner on this stage show was Malvolio the Magician. <laughs> he performed wonderful tricks, many of them, such as pouring water back and forth between pitchers. First, it, it turned to wine, and then it turned to beer, and then it turned to whiskey. I knew it was whiskey it finally turned into because he needed somebody to come up out of the audience to help him, and I came up. Both shows. <laughs> it was Kentucky straight bourbon. Uh, a very generous fellow, actually. He, he gave me souvenirs. Uh, he pulls from his back pocket a shimmering, rainbow-colored scarf. He gave me this. This is his um, magic scarf. You can have it, Laura. You wave it over canary cage and you get a bowl of goldfish. You wave it over the goldfish bowl and they fly away canaries. The wonderfulest trick of all was the coffin trick. <laughs> we nailed him into a coffin, and he got out of the coffin without removing one nail. 
There is a trick that would come in handy for me. Get me out of this two-by-four situation. Tom, shh! What are you shushing me for? You'll wake Mother. Oh, goody, goody. Pay her back for all those rise and shines! <laughs> you know, it don't take much intelligence to get yourself into a nailed-up coffin, Laura. But who in the hell ever got himself out of one without removing one nail? As if in answer, the father's grinning photograph lights up. The scene dims out. Immediately, the church bell is heard striking six. At the sixth stroke, the alarm clock goes off in Amanda's room. Good morning, good morning. It's time to rise this morning. Good morning, good morning. Rise and shine. <sighs> I'll rise, but I won't shine. Laura, tell your brother his coffee's ready. Tom, it's nearly seven. Don't make Mother nervous. Tom, speak to Mother this morning. Make up with her. Apologize. Speak to her. She won't speak to me. It's her that started not speaking. If you just say you're sorry, she'll start speaking. Oh, her not speaking. Is that such a tragedy? Oh, please, please. Laura, are you going to do what I ask you to do, or do I have to get dressed and go out myself? Going, going, as soon as I get my coat on. She pulls on a shapeless felt hat. Pleadingly glancing at Tom. Butter and what else? Just butter. Tell them to charge it. Mother, they make such faces when I do that. Sticks and stones can break our bones, but the expression on Mr. Garfinkel's face won't harm us. Tell your brother his coffee's getting cold. You do what I asked you, will you? Will you, Tom? <sighs> Laura, go now, or just don't go at all. Going, going! Ah! Laura? Oh, I'm all right. I, I, I slipped. But I'm all right. If anyone breaks a leg on those fire escape steps, the landlord ought to be sued for every cent he possesses. She shuts door, returns to other room. As Tom enters for his coffee, she turns her back to him and stands rigidly facing the window. Tom glances at her and slumps at the table. <sighs> Mother... I apologize, Mother. I'm sorry for what I said, for everything that I said. I, I didn't mean it. My devotion has made me a witch, and so I make myself hateful to my no, children. No, no, you don't. I worry so much. Don't sleep. It makes me nervous. I understand that. I had to put up a solitary battle all these years. But you're my right-hand bower. Don't fall down. Don't fail. I try, Mother. Try, and you will succeed. Why, you, you're just full of natural endowments, both of my children. They're unusual children. Don't you think I know it? I'm so proud, happy, and I, I feel I've so much to be thankful for, but promise me one thing, son. What, mother? Promise, son, you'll never be a drunkard. <laughs> I will never be a drunkard, mother. That's what frightened me so, that you'd be drinking. <sighs> Eat a bowl of Purina. Just coffee, mother. A shredded wheat biscuit? No. No, mother. Just coffee. You can't put in a day's work on an empty stomach. You've got ten minutes. Don't, don't gulp. Drinking two hot liquids make cancer of the stomach. Put cream in. No, thank you. To cool it. No! No, thank you. I want it black. I know, but it's not good for you. We have to do all that we can to build ourselves up. In these trying times we live in, all we have to cling to is each other. That's why it's so important to... Tom, I sent out your sister so I could discuss something with you. If you hadn't spoken, I would have spoken to you. What is it, Mother? What do you want to discuss? Laura. Oh. Laura. You know um. how Laura is. So quiet, but still water runs deep. She notices things, and I think she broods about them. A few days ago, I came in, and she was crying. What about? You! Me? She has an idea that you're not happy here. <laughs> What gave her that idea? What gives her any idea? However, you do act strangely. I'm not criticizing, understand that. I know your ambitions do not lie in the warehouse that, like everyone in the whole wide world, you've had to make sacrifices. But Tom, Tom, life's not easy. It calls for, for Spartan endurance. There's so many things in my heart that I cannot describe to you. I never told you, but I loved your father. I know that, Mother. And you, when I see you taken after his ways, Staying out late, and we'll, 
You have been drinking the night you were in that terrifying condition. Laura says that you hate the apartment, that you go out nice to get away from it. Is that true, Tom? No. No. Y you say there's so much in your heart that you can't describe to me. That's true of me, too. There's so much in my heart that I can't describe to you. So let's respect each other's... But why? Why, Tom? Are you so restless? Where do you go to nights? I... I go to the movies. Why do you go to the movies so much, Tom? I go to the movies because I, um... I like adventure. Adventure is something I don't have much of at work, so I, um, I... I go to the movies. But, Tom, you go to the movies entirely too much. I like a lot of adventure. <laughs> most young men find adventure in their careers. Then most young men are not employed in a warehouse. The world is full of young men employed in warehouses and offices and factories. Do all of them find adventure in their careers? They do, or they do without it. Not everybody has a craze for adventure. M man is by instinct a, a lover, a hunter, a fighter, and none of those instincts are given much play at the warehouse. Man is by instinct. Don't quote instinct at me. Instinct is something that people have got away from. It belongs to animals. Christian adults um. don't want it. <laughs> what, what do Christians adults want, then, Mother? Superior things. Things of the mind and the spirit. Only animals have to satisfy instincts. Surely your aims are somewhat higher than theirs, the monkeys, pigs... I reckon they're not. You're joking. However, this is not what I wanted to discuss. I haven't much time. Sit down. You want me to punch in red at the warehouse, mother? You have five minutes. I want to talk about Laura. All right. What about Laura? We have to be making some plans and provisions for her. She's older than you. Two years and nothing has happened. She just drifts along doing nothing. It frightens me terribly how she just... Drifts along. I guess she's the type that people call homegirls. There's no such type, and if there is, it's a pity. That is, unless the home is hers with a husband. What? Oh, I can see the handwriting on the wall as plain as I see the nose in front of my face. It's terrifying. More and more, you remind me of your father. He was out all hours without explanation. Then, left. Goodbye. And me with the bag to hold. I saw that letter that you got from the Merchant Marine. I know what you're dreaming of. I'm not standing here blindfolded. Very well. Then do it. But not till there's somebody to take your place. What do you mean? I mean that as soon as Laura has got somebody to take care of her, married, a home of her own, independent, why, then you'll be free to go wherever you please. On land, on sea, whichever way the wind blows you. But until that time, you've got to look out for your sister. I don't say me because I'm old and don't matter. I say for your sister because she's young and dependent. I put her in business college, a dismal failure. Frined her so it made her sick at the stomach. I took her over to the Young People's League at the church. Another fiasco. She spoke to nobody, nobody spoke to her. Now all she does is fool with those pieces of glass and play those worn out records. Now what kind of a life is that for a girl to lead? What can I do about it? Overcome selfishness. <sighs> self, self, self. Is that all you ever think of? Where's your muffler? Put your wool muffler on. Uh, Tom, I haven't said what I had in mind to ask you. I'm too late to... Uh, down at the warehouse, aren't there some nice young men? No. There must be some. Mother. Find out one that's clean living, doesn't drink, and ask him out for sister. What? For sister to meet, get acquainted. Oh, my God. Will you? Will you? Oh, will you, will you, dear? Yes! Amanda closes the door. We spot Amanda at the phone. Ella Cartwright? Uh, this is Amanda Wingfield. How are you, honey? How is that kidney condition? Oh, horse. Oh, you are just a Christian martyr. Yes, honey, that's what you are, Christian martyr. Uh, well, I just happened to notice in my little red book that your subscription to the Companion has just run out. Well, I knew that you wouldn't want to miss out on the wonderful serial starting in this issue. It's by Bessie Mae Hopper, the first thing she's written since Honeymoon for Three. Wasn't that a strange and interesting story? I know. Well, this one is even lovelier, I believe. It has a sophisticated society background. It's all about that horse he set on Long Island. It is early dusk on a spring evening. Supper has just been finished in the Wingf Wingfield apartment. Amanda and Laura are removing plates from the table, and Tom, in a white shirt and trousers, rises from the table and crosses toward the fire escape. Son, will you do me a favor? What? Comb your hair. You look so pretty when your hair is combed. 
There is only one respect in which I would like you to emulate your father. And what respect is that? <laughs> the care he always took of his appearance. He never allowed himself to look untidy. He throws down the paper and crosses to the fire escape. Where are you going? I'm going out to smoke. You smoke too much. A pack a day at 15 cents a pack? How much would that amount to in a month? 30 times 15 is how much. Tom, figure it out and you'll be astounded at what you could save. Enough to get you a night school course in accounting at Wash U. Just think about what a wonderful thing that would be for you, son. <laughs> I'd rather smoke. I know. That's the tragedy of it. Alone, she turns to look at her husband's picture. Across the alley from us was the Paradise Dance Hall. On evenings, in the spring, the windows and doors were open, and the music came outdoors. Sometimes the lights were turned out except for a large glass sphere that hung from the ceiling. It would turn slowly about and filter the dusk with delicate rainbow colors. Then the orchestra played a waltz or a tango, something that had a slow and sensuous rhythm. <laughs> Couples would come outside to the relative privacy of the alley. You could see them kissing behind ash pits and telegraph poles. This was the compensation for lives that passed like mine, without any change or adventure. Adventure and change were imminent in this year. They were waiting around the corner for all these kids, suspended in the mist over Burgett's garden, caught in the fold of Chamberlain's umbrella. In Spain, there was Guernica. But here, here there was only hot swing music and liquor, dance halls, ban, and movies, and sex that hung in the gloom like a chandelier and flooded the world with brief, deceptive rainbows. All the world was waiting for bombardments. Amanda turns from the picture and comes outside. A fire escape landing's a poor excuse for a porch. She spreads a newspaper on a step and sits down gracefully and demurely as if she were settling into a swing on a Mississippi veranda. What are you looking at? The moon. Is there a moon this evening? It's rising over Garfinkel's delicatessen. <laughs> so it is. A little silver slipper of a moon. Have you made a wish on it yet? Mm-hmm. What'd you wish for? That's a secret. <laughs> a secret, huh? Well, I won't tell mine either. I'll be just as mysterious as I you. I bet I can guess what yours is. Is my head so transparent? But you're not a sphinx. <laughs> no, I don't have secrets. I'll tell you what I wished for on the moon. Success and happiness for my precious children. I wish for that whenever there's a moon, and when there isn't a moon, I wish for it too. I thought perhaps you wished for a gentleman caller. Why do you say that? Don't you remember me asking to fetch one? I remember suggesting it would be nice for your sister if you brought home some nice young man from the warehouse. And I think I've made that suggestion more than once. Yes, you have made it repeatedly. Well? Well, we are going to have one. What? A gentleman caller. You mean you have asked some nice young man to come over? Yeah, I, uh, I asked him out to dinner. You really did? I did. Uh, you did, and did, did he accept? He did. Well, 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 that's... That's just lovely. Well, I, I thought you would be pleased. It's definite, then. Very definite. Soon? Very soon. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop putting on and tell me some things, will you? What things do you want me to tell you? Uh, naturally, I would like to know when he's coming. He's coming tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yep, tomorrow. But, Tom! Yes, Mother? Tomorrow gives me no time! Time I... for what? Preparations! Why didn't you phone me at once as soon as you asked him the minute he accepted? Then don't you see I could have been getting ready? You don't have to make any fuss. Oh, Tom, Tom, Tom. Of course I have to make a fuss. I want things nice, not sloppy, not thrown together. I certainly have to do some fast thinking, won't I? I don't see why you have to think at all. You just don't know. We can't have a gentleman collar and a pigsty. All my wedding silver has to be polished. The monogram table linen ought to be laundered. The windows have to be washed and fresh curtains put up. And how about clothes? We have to wear something, don't we? Mother, this boy is no one to make a fuss over. Do you realize he's the first young man we've introduced to your sister? It's terrible. Dreadful, disgraceful that poor little sister's never received a single gentleman caller. Tom, come inside. What for? I want to ask you some things. If you're going to make such a fuss, I'll call it off. I'll tell him not to come. You'll certainly do nothing of the kind. It's nothing offense, people worse than broken engagements. It simply means I'll have to work like a Turk. We won't be brilliant, but we will pass inspection. Come on inside. Sit down. Oh, any particular place you want me to sit? Oh, thank heavens I've got that new sofa. I'm also making payments on a floor lamp I have sent out and put the chins cover on so that'll brighten things up. Of course, I'd hope to have these walls repapered. What's the young man's name? His name is O'Connor. Oh, that, of course, 
means fish. Tomorrow is Friday. I'll have that salmon loaf with Durkee's dressing. What does he do? He works at the warehouse. Of course. How else would uh, I... Tom, he doesn't, he doesn't drink. Why do you ask me that? Your father did. Do not get started on that. He does drink, then. N not that I know of. Make sure, be certain, the last thing I want for my daughter is a boy who drinks. Aren't you being a little premature? Mr. O'Connor has not yet appeared on the scene. But will tomorrow, to meet your sister, and what do I know about his character? Nothing. Old maids are better off than wives of drunkards. Oh, my God. Be still. Lots of fellows meet girls whom they don't marry. Oh, talk sensibly, Tom, and don't be sarcastic. What are you doing? I'm brushing that cowlick down. What is this young man's position at the warehouse? This young man's position is that of a shipping clerk, Mother. Sounds to me like a fairly respectable job, the sort of job you would be in if you had just more giddy-up. Oh. What is his salary? Have you any idea? I, I would judge it to be, I don't know, approximately eight, eighty-five dollars a month. Well, not princely, but... Twenty more than I make. Yes, well, how well I know. But for a family man, $85 a month is not much more than you can just get by on. Yes, but Mr. O'Connor is not a family man. He might be, mightn't he? Sometime in the future? Oh, I see plans and provisions. You are the only young man I know of who ignores the fact that the future becomes the present, the present the past, and the past turns into everlasting regret if you don't plan for it. I will think that over and see what I can make of it. Don't be supercilious with your mother. Tell me some more about this. What do you call him? James. Uh, James D. O'Connor. The D is for Delaney. Irish on both sides. Gracious. And doesn't drink? Shall I call him up and ask him right this minute? The only way to find out about such things is to make discreet inquiries at the proper moment. When I was a girl in Blue Mountain, and it was suspected a young man drank. The girl whose attentions he had been receiving, if any girl was, would sometimes speak to the minister of his church, or rather, her father would do it if her father was living, a sort of feel out the young man's character. That is the way such things are discreetly handled to keep a young woman from making a tragic mistake. Then how did you happen to make the tragic mistake? That innocent look in your father's eye had everyone fooled. He, he smiled. The world was enchanted. You know, no girl can do worse than put herself at the mercy of a handsome appearance. I do hope that Mr. O'Connor is not too good looking. No, he's not too good looking. He's covered with freckles and he hasn't much of a nose. He's not downright homely, though? N not downright homely, just medium homely, I'd say. Character is what to look for in a man. That's what I've always said, Mother. You've never said anything of the kind, and I suspect you would never give it a thought. Do not be so suspicious of me. At least I hope he's the type that's up and coming. I think he really goes in for self-improvement. What reason do you have to think so? Well, he goes to night school. Oh, splendid. What does he do? I mean study. Uh, radio engineering and public speaking. Then he has visions of being advanced in the world. Any young man who studies public speaking is aiming to have an executive job someday. And radio engineering? A thing for the future. Both of these facts are very illuminating. These are the sorts of things a mother should know concerning any young man who comes calling on her daughter, seriously or not. One little warning. Um, he, uh, he doesn't know about Laura. I, I didn't let on that we had a dark ulterior motive. I, I just said, why don't you come and have dinner with us? He said, okay, and that was the whole conversation. I bet it was. You're as eloquent as an oyster. However, he'll know about Laura when he gets here. When he sees how lovely and sweet and pretty she is, he'll thank his lucky stars to be asked for dinner. Mother, you mustn't expect too much of Laura. What do you mean? Laura seems all those things to you and me because she's ours and we love her. We don't even notice she's... We don't even notice she's crippled anymore. Don't say crippled. You know that I never allow that word to be used. But face facts, Mother. She is, and that's not all. What do you mean that's not all? Laura is... Very different from other girls. I think the difference is all to her advantage. Not quite all. In the eyes of others, strangers, she's terribly shy and lives in a world of her own. And those things make her seem a little pecu peculiar to people outside the house. Don't say peculiar. Face the facts, Mother. She is. In what way is she peculiar, may I ask? She lives in a world of her own. A world of little glass ornaments, Mother. She plays old phonograph records and that's about all. He crosses to the door. Where are you going? I'm going to the movies. Not to the movies. Every night to the movies. I don't believe you always go to the movies. He is gone. Laura? Laura? Yes, Mother? Let those dishes go and come in front. Laura appears with a dish towel. Laura, come here and make a wish on the moon. Moon? Moon? 
A little silver slipper of a moon. Look over your left shoulder, Laura, and make a wish. Now, now, darling, wish. <laughs> what shall I wish for, mother? Happiness. Good fortune. All right, that's about as far as we can get tonight. Thank you, Mayo. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, John. Um, and for our last 15 minutes here, I want to I wanna do a little talk back. And I want to start with Madeline. <laughs> What was what was the accent experience like? Did it you know what what did you feel like? Um, it was funny. It was good. I, as most, I don't. Th this is my normal voice, obviously, which most people know and respect and love. Um, I hope, but I think it comes out occasionally. Um, mostly like like in in like a post wine situation uh the southern accent will come back i also think like being in new york um it's definitely diminished a lot and i think that's like part of it is, is conscious part of it's not i also very recently saw my brother uh and was told by some people who had met the two of us that his southern drawl was much stronger than mine and i did sort of hear myself adhering to his speech a little bit like over the weekend um which is funny but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think the, the Southern sound is underrepresented on stage, sort of in general. I also, I got to do a Southern accent one other time in um, Stupid Fucking Bird by Aaron Posner. Um, and that was really fun. And I think it's such a beautiful sound. And it has such unique intonations um, that I think it's a shame we don't whip it out more. Um, I mean, in the olden, ye olden times, I think it was more popular, but um, recently there's not a lot of chances to do it, and um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's very different. She's from, I, where is she? Is she from Mississippi? Tennessee? I think so. I Mississippi. Think Mississippi. Mississippi moved to Tennessee? I think what you're referencing is they, they reference Memphis, but I think that's an anecdote about someone else, so I think she's from Mississippi. Okay, I'm that's the about Delta, because I figured, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, which is obviously, I'm from north carolina well born and raised in texas mm, there was a there was a bit of an accent There's, there i'm from a, north carolina, half north carolina mm -hmm. half texas. um and i think yeah so i think my my studied and like that's when it like even when my southern accent comes out that like that is not what it sounds like that's like obviously um way stronger than mine is but um well according to the overlords at wikipedia blue um mountain, she's from blue mountain mississippi that makes mm -hmm. yeah that okay i was thinking that was a Late, I don't know. I was making making things up, but um, no, yeah. So I think with the the accent that I have in my head of family members and pe like people at home who have very very thick accents, it's obviously very North Carolinian, and um, I think people underestimate how different all of the accents are. Um, like Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana. Like they're all so different. So I, I was gonna try and like pinpoint it. Um, but I was indeed informed of this about 40 minutes beforehand, and then we had to read it through. So I was like, you know what? It's just she's going to be a Carolina gal, and we'll get past it. I'm sorry to those listeners out there who are just writhing in their cars <laughs> and saying, oh, she's not from <laughs> Miss she's not from North Carolina. See, I feel like only Southerners are the people who feel that righteous indignation. I'm, mm. sure, I'm sure they do. I... It'd be embarrassing yeah. if they're like, that was a terrible Southern accent. Like, I'd yeah. be embarrassed for both of us. Well, we got a real Southerner for y'all today. Well, we've so. done, you know, we've done an Irish accent we with have. a real Irishman before. We um, did do, we, 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 we had Con, who is an Irish individual. <laughs> 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 and he actually, he gave us a lot of coaching on our accents. Yeah, yeah, that he did. Um, um, we should well, do an if, Yeah, if we, ever, if we ever need a Southern accent coach, that yes, will we have be... Madeline. You know, we, we found our person, definitely. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the play, not so much the performance, but John, do you have any questions? Well, I think the principal question that comes up with this play is whether or not Amanda loves her children. Mm. Is she driven mm. by this like narcissistic void in her after her husband left her? Oh, that seems like a loaded or, question. I know. It's a, and you know what? Everyone John, make your answer. John, never give me any warnings for these things. Because I want you to think on your feet. <laughs> okay, and you know what I also want you to do? <laughs> yeah. I want you to answer in a southern accent. I can do that. Okay, so I think this is open for everyone, but like what do we all think the motivations of Amanda are? Do we think they're they're based in like a selfishness? 
are they based in like a weird like catharsis about her olden times or do you think she really is driven by this love for her kids i see maya thinking over here yes um i i am on amanda's side a little bit because oh. i think at this time uh she's on her own as far as we like the father's portrait is just looming over the space but mm -hmm. he's a very absent figure and I think sh her goals are to really preserve this family and its future, knowing that she can't take care of everyone forever. And unfortunately, a lot of that responsibility must fall on Tom. Um, and I think it's in interesting with Laura, because I always think it's when we find out later in the play, like she's older than Tom. She's like, it's been six and six or so years at least since she's been in high school. I think it's always a surprise at how old she is because yeah. she exudes such kind of a naivete and youth. Um, and so I think from at least the chunk that we've read since I've gotten more acquainted with it with this reading, but mm -hmm. I do believe that Amanda is really trying to, when she emphasizes to Tom that he can't just think about himself and his selfishness, I think it's because she believes she's doing selfless acts to preserve her family. And we see that with also with the catalogs that she's trying to, or the subscriptions she's trying to get people to um, renew. I think that's another way she's getting, or right. just trying to support yeah. her family. I mean, I find it hard to be against anyone in this play, really, because it, it feels very much like everyone's a prisoner of their own circumstance. And I, you know, which is, I guess, the nature of tragedy. But I... You know, like Amanda's just trying her best, doing her best, and more importantly, I think working with what she knows. I mean, she knows what it's like to field gentlemen callers. She knows what it's like to kind of make her way in that aspect of society. And what she doesn't know is how to adapt to the situation she's in. She wasn't raised for that. So she's doing her best and trying to get back onto familiar ground. So I do understand that. Um, you know, it, it reminds me very much, and I'm sure Madeline and Maya, you've had experiences of this sort of like great aunts were like, but when are you getting a boyfriend? It's like, mm, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's that's a good question as any. Um, and, and on the other hand, I think Tom is also a product of his time and a product of his place. And I can't, mm -hmm. you know, imagine how heavy something like this is for him. And you know, John, earlier you mentioned something about how Tom is generally read as gay mm -hmm. or as queer in general in these plays. Uh, sorry, in this play. I, you know, I wonder if that, did that, does that sort of impact how you approach the character or, or kind of understand his character? Not in this reading, it didn't. I think if we were to take like a more like dramaturgical approach to this, and like you know, Madeline said, we do these readings. Um, you know, we sit down, we do a reading, we talk about it a bit, and then we perform it. I think if you were to study it, I think that oppression would play a role in it. It would absolutely, if the choice would be to play it as a gay man who's repressed in the society. Um, but in this reading, the way I read the script, it's interesting that Maya said you were Team Amanda. I was sort of driven by the smothering of of mm. his mother. He just felt smothered. And I think it's interesting. I listen to this podcast a lot called Theater Talk, um, hosted, um, oh my gosh, by Susan Haskins. I don't know if anyone listens out there, but they had this big discussion. Um, the podcast has since ended, but there was a 2013 Broadway adaptation of The Glass Menagerie starring Cherry Jones. And in it, Cherry Jones played a very sympathetic Amanda Wingfield. And in this podcast episode that I've been thinking of since we started reading, they're kind of mad at Cherry Jones. They don't think her performance is good because they picture Amanda as this sort of monstrous woman, like this sort of like beast mm -hmm. on stage who was like cruel to her children, narcissistically driven by this almost like, like crazed desire to further her kids, not for their benefit, but for themselves. And so when I was performing Tom, especially during that monologue where he just goes crazy about the opium dens, I'm sort of adopting that perspective on Amanda, that she's not a considerate woman. She is a narcissistic and borderline abusive woman. Wow, scathing. That is a scathing take. Do I have to use my Amanda accent or can I just... No, As you just, were. Just Relax. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. You go, you're enough for this exact moment. Yeah, you know, I'll Maybe take not it. not other times. Um... I disagree with your reading, respectfully. How dare you? <laughs> Turn her mic off. <laughs> hey. Um, no, but I think, I don't know. I think similarly, like, in the reading, it's one thing, um, especially because we're, you know, just sitting here and, and having a good time, and we don't have to spend, like, weeks and months with these characters. But mm -hmm. in general, 
I'm kind of against the whole um, monstrous mother figure that sort of dominated this time mm. um, mm-hmm. and the mother's the root of the problems and like Tom isn't out of control and absolutely a subject to his own women impulse but it's his mom's fault um, I think is lets him off the hook unnecessarily and j- just kind of railing against the the fact that like she's got like you know as a single mother like she has two she has two hands right. and she can only do so much and if one of you is just sitting quietly at home it's the most she can do to like bring i think the suitors the suitors i read too the much gentleman callers. the gentleman callers mm. to the you know to them um and like i think it's kind of reasonable of her to be like you're a grown man like take care of yourself and like yeah. help us out a little bit um so i'm sort of and again like she's pretty graceless I would say, as a person. And I think a lot of what she reaches for is stuff from her past, which obviously is not even in line with the kid's contemporary experience in the 30s. Like, her childhood was 30 years before that. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think, like, we have to acknowledge that she's also spent the last 30 years in that house alone with her children mm-hmm. because she had to. Mm-hmm. And, like, making these calls and, like, trying to make money and trying to manage the two of the two kids is, like, the most she could have done. So, like, of course she, she kind of reaches backwards a lot um because i think it's kind of what she has to reach toward yeah um, which is yeah again back to the whole like prisoner of circumstance thing i think they're all just like stuck and i think as the matriarch she gets um you know a lot of that like burden of proof uh, you know of trying to account for the household um but i'm 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 team no one because they're all graceless but like yeah i don't know like circumstances yeah. are tough, people are hard, everyone's graceless, and I think it's more of like a tropish impulse to villainize Amanda rather than like an actual um, right. representation of her character. Yeah, and I wonder. I mean, Madeline, you mentioned something about you know Tom's a grown man. Why doesn't he help us out a little bit? I wonder how much of a gendered reading there is in this. And I mean, mm. I know there undoubtedly is one, but you know, Tom has his whole thing where he's like, you know, but who pays rent? Who pays the mortgage? Um, who does all these things economically just for the house and keeps us afloat. But he's not really pulling his weight in terms of society. You know, he's not actively finding gentleman callers for Laura. He's not around the house all that much. Mm -hmm. He's not really playing the part of man of the house other than just financially. So I wonder how much of a gendered reading there is and what both characters kind of expect of each other. And... You know, is this why they're at such an impasse? Because their perceived obligations don't match what the other considers important. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you say that because when I was looking up, I looked up on YouTube like a while ago because I read this in high school. And I remember looking up like last Menagerie videos and there was a there was a production done where Amanda was in drag, like a man in drag. And initially I didn't tol- I didn't like fully like think about the choice. But when you bring up the gendered reading, I think like gender as in as it does in a lot of these plays from like a societal period where it was a very strictly enforced concept is largely in the undertone like tom has a responsibility why because he's a man what do we need for laura a man and amanda Mm -hmm. has to take on this almost like masculine burden of organizing the children's lives and maybe it's her like divulgence into masculinity that makes us perceive her as a monster a little bit because she's a woman acting against oh, the societal that's, landscape. Oh, that's very Clytemnestra. It's like... Mm. Oh, wow, okay, bring in the Oedipus cycle. That's, that's really not the... Yeah. Clytemnestra? Clytemnestra? That's Eurystia. Yeah. The oh, you're yeah. right, from Agamemnon. You missed it. John. John. I took Lit Hum. Did you? I did. Recently. Did you do the readings? I did. <laughs> you're a freshman. I mean, I rising sophomore. I'm a sophomore sorry. now. Rising, yes. I have my rights. Bad, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. I have rights. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, it is back to the whole, like you know what's assertive and logistical in a man is bossy and overbearing in a woman right Right. also i think just to like round us out um i think like amanda herself just as an individual character comes from a society that is probably different than the one she's living in yeah it seems she seems a little incongruent with her children because she is she comes from a different time different place and like i still like i love my family but i'll be honest with the whole great aunt situation Mm. the whole like where's your man and i'm like it's me like, I'm the rich man I'm going to marry. Cher said that. Cher. Cher said. Cher said Her mom man. said. I yes. said the dessert thing. No, she said her no, mom said, you find yourself a rich man. And Cher said, I am a rich man. Yeah, oh, mom. But mom, queen. I am a rich man. To quote oh. Cher. To quote Cher. As we all should. As we all should. At all times. 
If I could turn back time. Well, I think we better end that before <laughs> John that sings more share. Oh, wait, speaking of which, sorry, John, can I do the transition? Can you do the transition? Yes, because it's honky tonk. Go for it. Okay, I'm sorry. So I can't do the intro? Well, no, because, listen, we're taking it back to Madeline's home state, home region. Um, I Now, this has been Soundstage, <laughs> um, WKCR's <laughs> weekly radio program. Tune in Tuesdays at 9 o'clock. We've got more fun, awesome, amazing radio plays coming up for you. This is WKCR FM New York and WKCR HD1. The time is what? The time is exactly 10 o'clock. Thank you for listening to Soundstage. And next, in a beautiful transition, we'll be doing the Honky Tonkin Show. That's right. <laughs> it's me, John, hosting... <laughs> <laughs> the Hockey Tongue and Show, um, Southern Swing Step. So if you want to hear what Amanda probably grew up listening to, <laughs> would you say that's fair? I would say that's fair. Thank you, Amanda. Well, now you have to play only stuff Dickens. from the 1910s. I know. So you're now binding I yourself to this. vastly no, different no, research. Well, you have the three minutes of the theme song to do it. But Wonderful. anyway, thank you all so all much right. for being <laughs> here tonight. This hey, has been bye. The Glass Menagerie and another iteration of Soundstage. And stay tuned. Farewell.